Podcastle, episode 757 for Tuesday, the 18th of October, 2022. Tales from the Vaults. Harlequin Moon by Jennifer Hikes, rated PG. Hello, and welcome to Podcastle. I'm Hamilton Perez, Associate Editor and Castle Guard aboard these ramparts for over five years now. In that time, I've helped shepherd many strange tales of adventure, humor, and woe, and faced many a dracolich, bugbear, and flock of fairy angry geese. But as the saying goes, all good things must come to an end sometime. And as life's various demands have become more demanding, I'm afraid that time has come for me. It's been a distinct honor to serve under these banners and to safeguard these stories as they pass through our halls. But before I hang up my helmet and turn in my shield, I have one more tale from the vault I'd like to share. This one, a Podcastle original from all the way back in December of 2015. Podcastle is very proud to present Harlequin Moon, by Jennifer Hikes. Jennifer Hikes lives with her husband and two cats just outside of Pittsburgh. She is fond of books, moonlight, and good yarns, both in the narrative and fiber sense. Her stories have appeared in Abyss and Apex and Betwixt. Your reader today is the incomparable Loris White. Loris has a BA in theater and currently resides in Michigan. Now, let's gather around the fire with our cups of hot tea and enjoy the story. Harlequin Moon by Jennifer Hikes The man called Dirt was a master of riddles. It was his only gift. He was not a riddler himself. From the time he could speak, he always called things exactly what they were and nothing else. He had tried once or twice in his childhood to craft a joke or to weave a pair of clever words together. But every time he tried to twist something sideways, he found that his tongue would not cooperate. So he stopped trying to be clever and went on his way, moving through his life in a straight line from day before to day after. He worked the fields on his family's farm. He carted vegetables to market. He paid his respects to the temple gods at all the appropriate times. He grew tall and broad of shoulder. But even in the prime of his youth, he moved with the deliberate calm of old age. He was not a riddler, but he was a master at solving riddles. Riddles opened up before him like hard seeds cracking open and unfurling layer after layer of leaf and petal. At his approach, knots untangled, snags loosened. Problems met resolutions, like old friends meeting for tea. His gift for solving things was the only reason anyone would have noticed him at all, and someone did notice him. It is a sphinx who roosts at the top of the black mountain, said the stranger, who called himself Featherstone. It is a sphinx who has halted our trade and blocked the pass. There is talk in the market, said Dirt, of bandits, perhaps, or a wolf pack. They sat in the little stone house at the edge of farmland that Dirt's family had tilled for five generations. It was evening, and the world outside was still. It was no wolf I saw, said Featherstone, with a rap of his walking stick on the flagstone floor. He was an older man, slight of build, but weighty of word. It was a lion, and an eagle, and a woman, and none of those things. You know what that must be. I do, said Dirt. Its riddle must be answered. Dirt shook his head. I cannot help you, he said. I've never left town before, and I know nothing of sphinxes. Our village is dying, said Featherstone. I have asked many people to send me to a riddle solver, 
and every one of them has told me to come to you. If you cannot, who else? I am no warrior, said Dirt. You needn't fight it, said Featherstone. You need only answer it. If it is answered, it will take its own life, and we will be free. Dirt checked the stew that was cooking in the hearth. It was not the first time he had fed a hungry traveler. There were many in town, and more stopping every day. Merchants stalled on the road, or families who could not reach their home on the far side of the mountains. None of them would dare the pass, and whatever waited there, it had left no survivors, no witnesses, but a few had escaped from the other side, the very foolish or the very desperate. Dirt did not think Featherstone was foolish. He took the pot off the fire and laid out plates for himself and his guest, because it was time for supper, and the presence of a sphinx in a faraway mountain did not change that. Will it give me the chance to answer? he asked. Many men stronger than I have died on the Black Mountain. Featherstone shook his head. That is why we need the help of a riddle solver, not a warrior. Dirt scooped equal amounts of stew into each bowl, first for Featherstone, then for himself. Then he added a little more for Featherstone, because the old man had traveled a long way. Come now, man, said Featherstone. Will you help? Dirt sat and ate in silence, waiting for the problem to unfold in his head but no answer satisfied him. His place was in his home, with plow and furrow and bushels of blue beans and sweet roots ready for market. But a gift given from the gods must be used and used well. Both choices were good and correct. He frowned. I do not know the answer yet, he said. Featherstone fixed a small gray eye on him, spear sharp. And when will you know the answer? Dirt shook his head. He did not know the answer to that either. Answers came to him when they would. Stay the night, he said. I may have one in the morning. Over the sounds of the morning market, over the shouting and the rattle of carts, and the honking of opinionated geese. Dirt heard his name being sung. Harlequin Moon was dancing through the market square while the crowd parted around her laughter. Dirt purchased a plum pastry, her favorite. The girl called Harlequin Moon was a lightning bolt of color against the browns and grays of the townsfolk. Her shirt and trousers were dyed in sunset reds and purples. Her hair was the color and curl of orange peels, and her smile was a bright demi-loon of lunacy. She twirled and spun and leapt in a half-familiar dance that Dirt could not quite name, moving like a flame through the crowd. Featherstone narrowed his spear-sharp eyes. She stopped at the baker's stall. Dirt wished her a good morning and handed her the plum pastry. The grass grows greater with the blessing of dirt, said Harlequin Moon in thanks. She bit into the plum pastry and turned to meet Featherstone, stare for stare. I am a jest, and I call me Harlequin Moon, she said, tilting her head to one side. What are you, and what do you call you? Featherstone glanced quickly at dirt, looking for an answer. Dirt said nothing. Ah. Uh he said, taking off his hat and bowing awkwardly. I am Featherstone, pleased to meet you. Mirrored, the baby is in a fine mood, she said, looking to the sky. Featherstone tilted his head. Your baby? He looked around, but no infant presented itself. Everyone's baby, she said. You know it. It's about eight hours old. Very cheerful temperament, and one bright eye, Dirk cleared his throat. She means to say the day is pleasant. She speaks sideways. 
I am the knot in the town's rope, she said, curtsying. Featherstone cooled. He looked her over once, then looked away. My day is well enough, thank you, he said. He turned his back on her then, and his eyes were full of pity for her and sympathy for Dirt. It was no effort for Dirt to understand those words, those familiar glances. Featherstone took her for the town lunatic, a homeless innocent who had latched onto him because he was the only one who could translate for her. His face and neck grew warm. I will give you your answer soon, Dirt said. His words were hoarse, his throat full of rough stones. Come, Harlequin. And he took her by the hand and led her away. Pleasant nightfall, she called back to Featherstone with a wave. On the temple steps they sat and ate their pastries. Dirt brooded. He had untangled the knot of his embarrassment, but it still weighed inside him, coiled and stubborn. Harlequin Moon lay back on the warm stone steps and stared at the sky. Is the sun still there when the clouds cover it? Dirt considered this and nodded. I'll be all right. Thanks. Turn the page, she said, waving one hand above her. I must see what came before and what comes next. He told her about the Sphinx, about Featherstone's request, about how the answer wouldn't come. Stones and Sphinxes, she sang. The Sphinx sits at that crossroads, and the stones pulled you down to the river's murky bottom. She sat up and looked at him. Her mouth was a frown. I don't know what I should do, he said. Summer comes from spring, comes from winter, said Harlequin Moon. The river carries earth to the ocean. Some earth, not all, he said. I am also needed here at the farm. Perhaps I could answer a sphinx, but it may not give me the chance to answer. Harlequin Moon shook her head. It will turn the page, she said. It must see what comes next. How can you know that, Harlequin? You've never met a sphinx before. I am a sphinx, she cried, throwing her arms up over her head, her fingertips stretched toward the sun like wings. On another day, Dirt might have laughed, but he felt too heavy for laughing today. He shook his head. This isn't the same thing, he said. You have never killed men for failing to answer your riddles. He set the rest of his bread aside and looked away. His appetite was gone. Harlequin's soft fingers touched the back of his hand, light as moth's wings. He looked up. Her blue moon eyes were watching him. Her smile was missing. Please, she said. Her voice was oddly solemn. Please help them. Help her. Fear trickled down his spine. Her words frightened him more than the Sphinx. If only because it was that final piece in the puzzle, the piece that revealed the only solution to his problem. He must go to the Black Mountain, and he must answer the monster who dwelled there. He could see the Black Mountain from his home when the weather was clear, a distant dark peak nestled among its greener siblings. Up close, it was a jagged, rotting tooth riddled with holes and clefts. Some said the whole mountain was hollow, but it hugged its secrets close and would not say. It did not yield when dirt drew near, as so many other problems did. It grew before him, proud and unbreakable, and slowly filled his world, till all he saw was dark stone, and all he felt was the weight of it pressing down on him. He was far from home, weary and gray with dust from the road. Harlequin skipped and danced and flitted at his side. She had come without asking and Dirt had not argued, knowing from the outset that he had no words to stop her. 
Her presence eased his fear a little, but the firefly light of her smile did not burn away the mountain's shadow. He found the path as Featherstone had told of it. At the base of a storm-blasted tree, a narrow track that wound up through the underbrush like a snake, he traced its path into the woods. He could see sunlight on the far side of the trees, where the green stopped and the dark iron-gray stone began. There was no sign of the Sphinx. The path was peaceful and kept no secrets. Everything was exactly as it appeared to be. Still he paused, looking for shadows or strangeness, waiting for the world to shift. Harlequin smiled at him. The Sphinx sits at the crossroads, she said, and began to skip up the path. Wait, he cried. She perched on a rock and looked at him, head tilted. He wanted to call her back, but there was nothing to call her back from. The sun was high and the birds sang. The trees were the same as the ones he saw every day, and the gentle winds carried familiar smells. Harlequin Moon extended her hand to him. Her smile was crisp and fearless. He stepped onto the path and began the long climb to the Sphinx, thinking only of one step, and then the next, and then the next. Harlequin Moon leapt from her perch and danced along just ahead of him. In the tongue of his people, the word for dirt meant many things. It was the rich soil of cultivated fields. It was a place. It was the whole sweep of land, farms and forest and all, where the town nestled. It was the world. But no matter its larger or greater meanings, it always came back to that solid, steady ground beneath one's feet. He liked that. It was an honest word. So when it came time for the turning right, the young man, who was a little too tall and a little too broad-shouldered for his sixteen years, regarded his gathered family and neighbors with the placid gaze of one who knew what he was and what he wanted, and he told them all that he would like to be called Dirt. Dirt heard the Sphinx long before he saw her shadow or felt the beat of her wings through the air. Her voice pierced his mind, a long, drawn-out shriek like a claw being dragged across glass. Through the aching noise, he watched in stunned detachment as the dirt path rose up to meet him. He hit the ground with a soft thud. The shriek resolved itself into words, I blink but have no eyes, I fly but have no wings, I shine but have no fire. The riddle burrowed into his brain, demanding an answer, but Dirt had no answer. He couldn't think through the terrible noise. He pressed his hands against his ears, he pressed his face into the earth, but he could not keep out the Sphinx's voice. I blink but have no eyes, I fly but have no wings, I shine but have no fire. The riddle clawed at his insides for an answer that wouldn't come. Finding nothing, it pulled a raw cry of pain from his throat instead. His whole body spasmed. He felt the wind of its downbeat on the back of his neck and tried to crawl out of the way as a bulky shadow descended through the trees. He thought he heard Harlequin Moon calling his name. He wanted to call back to her, but his throat was empty, as if the Sphinx had yanked from him in that single pained cry, all noise that was not an answer to its riddle. He looked up. Its body was a fragmented blur, a lion, and an eagle, and a woman, and none of those things. His head ached, his eyes watered. He thought he saw a face, 
but he was not sure. He looked away. Branches snapped. Leaves and dirt flew in the sharp gusts from the creature's wings. He closed his eyes and tried to drag himself into the underbrush off the path. Harlequin's arms wrapped around his waist pulled him towards the trees, but the ground gave way beneath them. A dark cleft opened with a sigh of earth on stone, and they fell. He woke coughing in the dark. His hands felt along the floor and found only dirt and rough stone. Dull pain throbbed in his calf. Gently he pushed himself up and felt along his leg, poking and prodding the muscle, feeling out the nature of his pain. It was tender, but not broken. He looked around the little cave. He tried to call Harlequin's name, but no sound came from his throat. He probed the soft skin of his neck and frowned. His voice was gone, drawn from him by the Sphinx. He knew it as well as he knew the truth of anything. A boot tapped softly against the rough stone behind him. Harlequin Moon stood before the light of the cleft through which they tumbled. The sunlight made her orange hair glow like a halo. She was looking at the sky. He pulled himself up, fingers digging into the craggy, damp wall. His leg ached, but it held his weight. He limped over to Harlequin. She was as still as a rabbit who had spotted a hawk. He had never seen her so still. Not below us, she said as he drew up to her side. But above, not earth, but a moon. Inside him, in the space where the Sphinx's screaming had been, there was silence. And into that silence, the answer opened to him with familiar ease. Not earth, but a moon. Of course, he opened his mouth, eager to thank Harlequin for her help, eager to speak the answer and be done. His lips formed the words, but no sound came out. She looked straight at him. She reached up, touched his throat. Her fingers were gentle. The earth is still blind, she said. Was the moon not the correct answer? But it must be. He knew it as he knew the truth of anything. She shook her head, as if she knew what he meant to say, as if the textures of his silence were a language she understood. He frowned. Through looks and gestures, then, he spoke to her. I shall answer her, and she shall take her own life. He drew one finger across his throat, and then we shall go home. Is that not what you asked me to do? She slapped him. The earth is sightless, she hissed. The moon is a sphinx. The sphinx is a moon. Would you ask the moon to die? He stared at her. His fingers found his stinging cheek, but he could not make sense of it. She turned, the heel of her boot scraping like a sphinx's claw on stone, and stalked away into the dark. Dirt had known Harlequin Moon for many years before her turning right. She was the daughter of a town councilman, her family wealthy and well-placed. Every day she was dressed in jewels. Dirt's family lived at the edge of her world, but at markets and during festivals, when all the worlds met and moved together, she would linger by his family's vegetable stalls or he would sit on the temple steps, and she would make up riddles, and he would solve them. She grew taller, and then he did. After his turning right, she delighted in coming up with as many riddles on the word dirt as she could discover, and he delighted in answering them. But day by day, her own turning right drew closer. Her smile came less easily, her riddles less frequently. Her handmaids bound up her orange curls in nets of gold thread. She no longer lingered by the vegetable stall. The day before her turning right, she passed him on the street. She did not look at him, but her steps slowed, and she spoke to the air before her. 
The moon dances and shines and nobody admonishes her. Dirt did not know what she meant. The next day, the lady he saw on the temple steps was a stranger. They had powdered her face and painted her lips. And her hair was pinned back so that every curl lay flat. Their eyes met over the crowd only once, and she looked away. Dirt held those blue moon eyes in his memory, knowing they would never meet his own again. She would name herself Primrose or Butterfly and be engaged to a young man of a finer family than his. He had always known this. But as her father read through the official notices, her hands reached up and one by one she plucked out the golden pins that bound her curls. A murmur ran through the crowd. Her mother, a plump, soft woman named Clover, clutched her breast in horror as her daughter began to laugh loudly like a fountain bursting up from the stones. In that gush of laughter, she named herself Harlequin Moon and declared before the entire town that she would now speak only in riddles. Then she danced off the stage as her mother fainted and her father stared and dirt knew. She was a joke, a jest, a spinning moon high above the solid earth, Harlequin Moon. Dirt sat in the little patch of light cast through the cleft and listened. He heard the beat of great wings, strange and distant. He closed his eyes and set the pieces of the puzzle before him. Sphinx, earth, moon, harlequin moon, his voice, the riddle, death. A piece was missing. He moved closer to the winding path that harlequin had taken and listened. He heard only silence. He moved into the darkness after her. The path wound about, carved through the ages by wind and water. He lost the light quickly, but he held his hands on both walls and walked down the path one step at a time. It yielded to him as so many problems did. The path split once. Without pause, he took the path to his left. Distant light glimmered on those walls, and Harlequin Moon always loved the light. The path climbed up through the mountain and opened into another cave. Sunlight poured through a hole in its roof. Harlequin Moon sat in the little patch of light, her knees drawn up to her chest, her eyes closed. He sat down across from her and waited. The Sphinx beat her wings. She was not far away. He could hear her claws scrape rock as she landed. Harlequin Moon opened her eyes and looked up through the hole. What is the turning right? she asked. It was hardly a riddle. Dirt thumped his chest and lay his hand flat on the floor of the cave. It is the day we name ourselves, and I named myself Dirt. Her smile was small and sideways. She began to riddle, and one by one, the riddles translated themselves in Dirt's head, as they always did. What is the turning right? It is the day we answer the riddle of who we are. You are a farmer's son, and you name yourself Dirt. And that is what you are. Solid, holding everything up. But I did not want to answer that riddle. I would have to be Rose Petal or Ruby and a lady with such a name would be married to Golden Wolf or Bright Eagle, and all of life would be set out before me. No more riddles. If I answered that question, it would be the end of me. She closed her mouth and looked at him, her eyes bright with unshed tears. I would die. In his mind's eye, he watched her dancing off the stage shedding her pins and her jewels, giving up a life of wealth and ease to become the town lunatic. Her father had used his influence with the temple to have her declared a holy innocent, which made her sacrosanct. 
She was kept clothed and fed, and any house must shelter her if she came to its door. Still, there was a barrier between her and all others now, which only dirt could cross, and she had made that choice willingly. He pointed to her heart and then to the sky and made a sharp, cutting-off gesture across his mouth. You named yourself a riddle just so you would never be answered? Another part of the puzzle opened up. Worry squeezed his heart. Did you not want me to answer you all this time? She laughed. The sound echoed like little bells in the sunlit cave. Speaking to the moon is not the same as telling the moon to hold still. She turned away. A blush was blooming across her cheeks. She wound a bright curl between her fingers and would not look at him. You always let me dance. Dirt's heart thudded, and he saw once more the barrier of riddles that she had built, which only he could cross, the riddle whose answer he had dared not speak, not even to himself. He reached into the light and touched her hand. His own hand was broad and thick with calluses, so different from hers. She smiled and intertwined her small fingers with his. The moon needs an earth, she said. He leaned forward and kissed her once, gently on the lips. I love you too. The answer was that simple. They leaned their foreheads together. Her fingers brushed his open throat. Harlequin moon, he said, not for proof that his voice had returned but for the joy of speaking her name. She beamed. Her smile was sunlight. He squeezed her hand. I am sorry about before, he murmured. I do not wish the moon to die or to stand still. She touched his cheek and nodded. Then do not answer the question of her. That was the final piece. He held it out in front of him, turned it around and over, he set it by the other pieces and saw. Featherstone had wanted him not to solve the Sphinx's riddle, but to solve the problem of the Sphinx, to pin her down. But he could not pin her down, for she herself was a riddle beyond answering. All he saw were feathers and claws, a creature that was woman and lion and eagle and none of those things. She could only be pinned down if she were dead. Answer the question of me, and I would die. Outside the mountain, the Sphinx's wings beat at the sky. A shadow blocked the light briefly, then was gone. He looked at Harlequin, his beautiful, unanswerable moon, and stood. They followed the path up through the mountain until they came to another cleft, large enough for them to pass through. Dirt leaned out and looked around. He felt her shadow first. He pulled back into the cave just before she landed with a terrible crunch of stone. Claws dug into the cleft, searching, tearing at the mountainside. A wordless screech pierced his ears, sharp as lightning, a sound that was both a woman's wail and an eagle's angry cry. The loneliness of it squeezed his heart. I blink but have no eyes. I fly but have no wings. I shine but have no fire. He lifted his eyes to look at the Sphinx through the cleft, but he could not make sense of what he saw. A burst of feathers whose color he could not name. A face he could not recognize hair that was tawny or maybe black. It hurt to look at her. He turned away. Harlequin Moon walked past him towards the cleft. He reached for her, tried to pull her back, but his hands clutched only air. When he looked in the Sphinx's direction, everything blurred, and he could not find Harlequin. A claw plunged through the cleft, a thousand talons snapped. He cried out. 
unsure if it had struck Harlequin, but she did not move. Speak, she said, her voice a drop of calm in a storming sea. We listen. The talons twitched, snapped once or twice more, then withdrew. The mad fluttering of wings died down, and the voice in Dirt's head fell silent. The sphinx and her shadow moved away from the cleft. Dirt looked up. He could see Harlequin again, only one of her clear and distinct. She stepped towards the cleft. She looked back at Dirt and called him forward with a slight bob of her head. He wanted to speak a warning, but there was nothing to warn her about. The Sphinx had accepted her offer. The path was open. He knew it as he knew the truth of anything. He held out a hand for her to hold as she slipped out through the jagged rock. A rough, stony path clung to the mountain just outside. He followed her and looked full at the Sphinx. Light scattered through her. She was a thousand things and none of them. His eyes watered and he dropped his gaze, looking only at the ground beneath her clawed feet. I blink but have no eyes, she said. I fly but have no wings. I shine but have no fire. So you do, said Dirt. He took Harlequin Moon by the hand. This is my beloved riddle, and she calls herself Harlequin Moon. I am her dirt. The Sphinx shifted and leaned forward. She seemed a little clearer now, but still he could not tell if she had spread her wings or if they stayed perfectly still, pressed against her sides. Her breath was hot and smelled of faraway lands and the flowers of strange trees. Moon, said Harlequin, find your earth. A soft rumble grew in the Sphinx's chest. She said nothing, but Dirt felt her curiosity brush through his mind like breath passing over his cheek. Dust rose along the path and he heard the beating of great wings. He closed his eyes against the flying grit. When he opened them again, the Sphinx and her shadow were gone. They were alone on the mountain, and the sky was clear. Harlequin Moon raised her arms and began to dance down the path towards home. Humming a half-familiar song he couldn't quite name, he smiled and followed after. And we're back. The thing I love about this story is how the author explores the power of names and words, our imperfect way of understanding the world through language, and the mysteries that imperfection creates. There's magic there, the same magic that keeps us wrapped as a riddle or a story unfolds. That was our show for this week. On behalf of everyone at PodCastle, our audio engineers, Devin Martin and Eric Valdez, our forum moderator, Aussie Cat, your co-editors, Eleanor R. Wood and Shingai and Jerry Kagunda, assistant editor, Sophie Barker, host, Matt Doby, as well as all of our amazing first readers, Hayden Doyle, Andrew K. Ho, Craig Jackson, Amalia Harrington, Julia Pat, Caitlin Zavonovich, Karen Corsini, Ryan Cole, Sarah S. Messenger, Sri Kripa Krishna Prasad, Tarver Nova, Tierney Bailey, Zeev Wheaties, and myself. Hamilton Perez. Thanks for letting us share another story with you. Be sure to share this episode with your friends, reach out to us on social media, and if you would like to keep up with all Escape Artists podcasts, head to patreon.com slash EA podcasts for more. Podcastle will be back next week with another tale. See you then. <laughs>